Hello! So today I want to talk about textures in OpenGL, because textures are quite an important part of graphics development, but they can also be a bit tricky sometimes. Now the usual disclaimer again, yes I am going to use C Sharp in this video, but everything that I'm going to explain works for any programming language with OpenGL bindings. Now, textures in OpenGL are really just glorified arrays that you can send to the graphics card. OpenGL offers 1D, 2D and 3D textures and all of them just store basic data in a sequential format. So even though you might think that textures are strictly for working with 2D images, you can actually use them however you want. But sure, we will just be focusing on images for now, since that is probably what most people want to use them for anyway. So how do we get started? Well, we can start off by making some sort of geometry to put the texture onto later. This can be a 3D model you found online, or it can be a simple geometrical shape like a cube, or in our case, a square, or well, two triangles. Next, we can create an OpenGL texture object by calling glGenTexture. This function just returns an integer that represents the texture object that OpenGL made internally. Nothing fancy here. Now, before we can actually put any data in it, we have to bind it first. We can do that by calling glBindTexture, which requires the integer ID we just got from glGenTexture and the type of texture that we want to use. This can be texture 1D, texture 2D, texture 3D, and many different variations of these. But we will just be using a simple glTexture 2D for this video. Unfortunately, OpenGL does not remember this, so we will have to tell OpenGL that we are working with a GL Texture 2D quite often. Next up, we can actually call GL Text Image 2D, which we can use to put some data into our texture. Now, of course, I have already loaded in my image using the C Sharp System.Drawing library, but you can load in your own image using any image loading library you want. It's just important that you get an actual array of pixels from whatever you use. Maybe you can get an array of float pixels, an array of integer pixels, or an array of byte pixels. All should be fine. GLTextImage2D will first ask us for the type of texture we're using again. There are a bunch of 2D texture formats in OpenGL, so it is actually necessary to ask this even though we are explicitly calling TextImage2D. Anyway, just fill in GLTexture2D again. Next up, it needs the mipmap level of the image. Now, for if you don't know, a mipmap is basically a pre-scaled version of your original image. This can be used to more accurately sample your image when it is rendered on a smaller or larger area. You are completely free to not use mipmaps, but then your texture may not look as good when it is shrunk down or scaled up by OpenGL. Now OpenGL can generate the mipmap images for you, which we will be doing later, but you could, if you wanted, create your own mipmaps and load them in using this function. But in any case, the original image, which we are loading in now, is always mipmap level 0. Then we need to give the function the internal format of the image. This is basically the format OpenGL will be using to store the image and which you then also will be using to read the image in your shader. I usually just use glRGB or glRGBA depending on whether I need the alpha channel or not. In any case, the pixel data will be stored as 3 or 4 floats in a vector, which is handy when we're using it in the shader. After this, the function just needs the width and height of the image in pixels. Should be easy enough, right? And then it needs the quote unquote border. Now, the specs say that this value should just always be zero, so my guess is that this parameter is simply deprecated now in newer versions of OpenGL. Might have done something in the past, but not anymore. Next up is the format of the pixel array that you are trying to load in. Is your image laid out in RGB, RGBA, BGRA? This is where you need to specify this. Now, this is of course different for every image file format, so you might want to look this up on the internet or just try a couple of different options and see which one works for you. Next, we only have two more parameters to go. The second to last one is the type of data that is in your pixel array. Like I said, you might have a library that stores your pixels in floats. In that case, you would use glfloat here, but your library might also store your pixels in integers. So check out how your image is loaded in and find the appropriate parameter in the list in the OpenGL specs. Link is in the description below, of course. 
And lastly, of course, is the actual data itself, or rather just a pointer to it. If you are working in C or C++, you need to give this parameter a pointer to your pixel data. If you are in Java or C Sharp, you can probably just put the actual array here. This can depend a little bit on your language. Now before we actually go ham and use our texture on our square, we might want to consider what OpenGL does in the case of wrapping and filtering. A 2D texture in OpenGL can be sampled using 2D coordinates S and T. Now the texture itself only ranges from 0, 0 or bottom left to 1, 1 or top right. If you would sample something outside of this range, let's say 2.5, 1.3, then you'd be reading outside of the actual image. This is called wrapping. Now we can specify exactly what should happen in this scenario using GL text parameter i. The texture needs to still be bound to the current context of course when we use this function. The first parameter it needs is the type of texture of course, GL texture 2D. Next it needs to know which parameter we want to change. This would be either GL texture wrap s and or GL texture wrap t. Remember that S is the texture X coordinate and T is the texture Y coordinate. You can tell OpenGL to work differently for either dimension, but you probably want to set both to the same thing. Lastly then, the function needs to know what to do in the case of wrapping. We have four options. GL repeat will simply repeat your image over and over. So 2.5, 1.3 will just show the pixel at 0 0.5, 0 0.3. This is what I usually use for my textures. You could also use GL mirrored repeat, which would do the same thing, but it would mirror your image in the axis that you are wrapping. Since 2.5 is wrapping twice, so to speak, the X coordinate is not mirrored or well mirrored twice. But Y equals 1.3 is, so our image would be mirrored in the Y direction. A less confusing and probably more useful one is GL clamp to edge. This will simply read the pixel on the border of the image that is closest to the coordinate you are trying to sample. So 2.5, 1.3 would sample the top right pixel of the image. This can be nice if you are only slightly sampling out of range, since you will get a pretty smooth looking border. Then there is also the case of sampling. We talked about mitmaps before and this is where they come into play. If you render your image on a different scale than the original, one pixel on your screen will not exactly line up with one pixel on the image. So you need to tell OpenGL how to deal with this. We can again use GL text parameter i for this. Again, GL texture 2D as the first parameter of course. And for the second parameter, we can set GL texture min filter and GL texture mac filter. The min filter tells OpenGL what to do when the texture is rendered smaller and the mac filter tells it what to do when it is rendered larger. In practice, you probably want these two to be the same. Without mitmaps, you only have two options here, GL nearest and GL linear. GL nearest will simply return the pixel nearest to where you are sampling the image. Makes sense. And GL linear will return the weighted average of the four pixels closest to your sample. So the nearest version will give you a more pixelated look and the linear version will give you a more faded or out of focus look. Neither are perfect, but they might be good enough depending on what you're trying to do. If you do include mitmaps, you get some more options. Of course, you can load in some mitmaps manually using GL text image 2D, but you might also let OpenGL generate them for you using the function GL generate mitmap. We will do the latter option here since I'll admit it, I'm too lazy to create my own mitmaps. Anyway, now we can use GL nearest mitmap nearest, GL linear mitmap nearest, GL nearest mitmap linear, and GL linear mitmap linear. What these do is pretty self-explanatory. GL nearest mitmap nearest, will take the nearest mitmap to the size of the texture that you are rendering and will take the nearest pixel from that from where you are sampling. GL linear mitmap linear will take the weighted average of the four closest pixels to the sample on the two closest mitmap levels. Then it will take the weighted average of these two results. This can give you some pretty clear looking results. Now the final step is to actually use the textures. We will first need to create a buffer with texture coordinates that matches up with the object we are trying to render it on. So for our square with four vertices, we need four texture coordinates as well and put them in a buffer. Of course, a square is pretty easy to work with. So we'll give the bottom left vertex the 0, 0 coordinate and the top right one the 1, 1 coordinate and that should work. If you're working with a more complicated object, this might be a bit more difficult. Luckily, most 3D model formats also provide you with texture coordinates when you read in the vertices. In any case, 
When you do have the coordinates, just put them in a buffer and enable a new vertex attribute pointer like you would when using normals, colors or even vertices. You can see me do this in the code right here. This is not a video on rendering with shaders or on vertex attribute objects, so I'll link a good video on that in the description below. Now that we have done that, we can head over to our shaders. Here we can add the texture coordinates as an input in the vertex shader and we can pass it through to our fragment shader. In our fragment shader we can add a sampler 2D which is the type of a 2D texture with a nice name. Then in the main function we can use the texture coordinates to sample the texture and we can get an RGB or RGBA vector back. Then we can just set our output color equal to this sampled texture color and we are done. Just make sure that when you now render your object that the texture is still bound just like how the shader program should always be bound when rendering and there we go our beautiful texture on a square now this was quite a long video on textures but we have only scratched the surface of what you can actually do with them in the future i might revisit this topic and explore some more advanced features and uses for these things and if you are still stuck on something, don't be afraid to ask me in the comments or head over to my Discord server. We have an awesome community over there who would love to help you out. You can also check out this article that I found over on the open.gl website. It's pretty good. Alright, and that was really it. I hope you all learned something and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye!